Our scripture today is from the letter to the Philippians. And we're starting with chapter one. Um, before I left, we were in Acts and we were going through some of the stories of Paul. One of the ones we heard was when he was in Philippi uh, in jail, because that's where Paul is a lot of the time. Um, and him and Silas were in jail, and of course the, the earthquake and their chains were broken open, and they could have gone for a jailbreak, but they didn't, uh, and the jailer was converted. Paul's MO was kind of to start a church and then write leave and write letters to that church. So this is a letter to the church at Philippi. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart for all of you sharing God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best, so that on the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, for the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped spread the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ, and most of the brothers and sisters have been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some were playing Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish, selfish ambition, not sincerity, but intending to increase my suffering in my prison. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I, will, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So as I said, um, we're in a, a new drama now, <laughs> right? We had the Gospels, um, which were the, the stories of Jesus's life and ministry, and then Acts, which is kind of a continuation. It's the stories of the early church. It's a continuation uh, uh, primarily of the Gospel of Luke. Um, now we're in the letters. Now we're into reading the personal correspondence um, between Paul and the churches that he wrote, that he wrote to, that he founded. So I, I imagine, um, you know, 2,000 years from now, somebody finding the letters that I wrote to all of you during COVID and say, now this is this is gospel. This is what we have to do, right? <laughs> this, this is the way it is. And so I think sometimes we, we look at Paul's letters and we take them out of context, forgetting that they were to a particular time and a particular place and a particular people, um, both individuals and as a community. So I don't think we have to, you know, look at the, at the epistles, look at the letters of Paul and say, well, everything that Paul says has to be absolutely true. But neither can we just divorce them from the Bible, from the Bible and, and put them aside and say, well, if they're just letters, they're not worth anything. Paul's got some good stuff to say. Now, you've heard me say this before, that I have issues with Paul some days. <laughs> Paul and I have a love-hate relationship. Some days I love what he says, and other days I want to toss him across a room. And that's, I think, not a bad thing. But 
in this gospel, in this epistle, in, in this letter, Paul is um, perhaps the most lovey <laughs> that, he usually, that he usually is, right? Um, he is, for most of his other letters, he has a particular reason to write. They've uh, maybe the community has written to him and said, hey, what do you think about this question? Um, maybe he's writing to them because he's heard that they're being nasty to each other. Uh, he wants to set them straight and say, no, stop being mean to each other. This is the way that you love. Love is patient, love is kind, all of those good things. Yes, that's not just for weddings. Uh, it's actually written to a community who was not very happy with each other, and he was trying to remind them of what it meant to love each other. Um, but this one doesn't seem to have that. This one just seems to be Paul's in prison. We don't know where. Paul's always in prison somewhere. Um, probably Rome, maybe not. We're not 100% sure. But he seems to have a lot of time on his hands, and he's thinking about the Philippians. He's giving thanks to God for them, and he wants to let them know. And so he writes them a letter. And that's pretty cool. This, this starts out with Paul saying, I thank my God every time I think of you. What a wonderful way to start a letter. I'm guessing that's not how we start most of our emails. Anybody start emails that way? No. <laughs> because that's not our norm, right? But, but Paul is, is wanting to express that, is wanting to share with others what he feels, what he thinks, how much he appreciates them. And I think our world would be a heck of a lot better if we did that more often. You know, I was, I was thinking, um, I was thinking the other day, I was telling some of you that uh, my mom and my grandparents were here and it was wonderful to see them. They were here for, well, they were supposed to be here a week. Um, and we all know that uh, flights have been challenging. And so they were supposed to fly out on Tuesday night. They did not get out till Thursday morning. And so we stayed in a hotel in Regina for a couple of nights because with the price of gas, trying to come two hours back down here just to go back up again. And we were there and the staff was just amazing at that particular hotel. Uh, and so after breakfast one morning, my mom went over to the desk and there's a couple people there and she said, you know, is there a manager on staff? And, you know, people kind of get a little antsy when you ask for the manager. <laughs> they think you're going to tell them you're going to blast them for something, right? And so the, the lady said, yeah, she's I'm the assistant manager, you know, what can I help you with, ma'am? And my mom says, I just want to let you know how much I appreciate your staff. They have made what could be a challenging time for us into a really good one. And the woman was really surprised. <laughs> and she said, you know, Jesus, we don't hear that. We get told all the things. We get, we get told when something isn't right. We get told when people are just mad because their flight got canceled and they're taking it on us. We get told all the bad stuff. But we don't hear the good, right? When I used to uh, go to a program called STAR, Students Together Against Racism, um, I was one of, I, I was in it as a kid, and then I ended up being a leader in, the, in my later years of high school. And uh, we used to have an activity where you had your home group and you went around the circle. And as you went around the circle, you said something about every single person, something that you appreciated about them. And at first it was awkward and all get it. <laughs> At first, you're sitting there going, and you know, some of the, you start maybe four or five away from you, and you're going around the circle, and you're thinking, I don't have to say anything. I don't, what if somebody says the same thing I want to say? Or will it sound weird if I say that? You know, because of course we're, you know, older elementary and early teenagers, and so you don't want to sound awkward or weird or whatever. And then somewhere about halfway around the circle, you go, oh crap, they're going to do this for me too. And it's really weird. And it's really awkward to sit there and have, you know, 15 other kids tell you what they like about you and what they appreciate about you. But somewhere along the way, it actually, you start to realize that this is how we should be living. This shouldn't be something that's odd. This shouldn't be something that's different. I saw something this week 
that said anything that can be said at a funeral should be said before a funeral. Anything that you want to say to the person who's about to die, or you know, even if they're not about to, you know, whatever we want, whatever we would say about them, um, you know, all the good stuff that we appreciate about them when they're lying here in a casket, we should be saying to their face. We should be telling them on a daily basis. And I think that's what Paul is trying to model for us here. I don't know that he necessarily realizes that he's going to be put down in, you know, for all history as his letter is going to be become biblical. But I think he's trying to, to model this idea of gratitude, this idea of community, of, of sharing. And so I wonder how we do that as part of the church. Sometimes we do it really well, and sometimes we really don't do it well. Sometimes we we start as a church community to take people for granted, right? To, to just say, oh, well, Joe Blow always does this. He's done it for however many years. Everything, he, he's always going to do it, right? Or, or Jane Doe has, has done this forever and always. I've never known anybody else to do it. I, I said thank you once 10 years ago. Why do I need to say it again? So that's not actually a good way to live, I don't think. It takes some intentionality. It takes us actually stopping and slowing down and thinking about who we're grateful for and how we're grateful for them and why we're grateful for them. And then it takes a little bit of getting over the awkwardness in our heads about, well, will they think it's weird if I go up and say that? But that's how we build a community. That's how we build a strong community that knows that every single one is valid. That's how we build the body of Christ, right? Paul doesn't mention it in this scripture, but throughout all of his other uh, scriptures, he's, he's always talking about this body of Christ, right? That, that the hand cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. The eye can't say to the ear, yeah, you, you know what, but you could just get off the head, I don't need you. We are all valued members of the body of Christ, but it's easy for us to forget that when we don't share our, our appreciation. Now, being part of the body of Christ doesn't mean just that we come and be part of the church. It doesn't just mean that you come and show up on Sunday morning, or that you, it doesn't even mean that you come and you do a whole bunch of work for the church. It means that to have that same, same mind, that same compassion, that same love, that same care for others that was found in Jesus Christ. And so Paul says that, you know, I am longing for you with the compassion of Christ. This is the model that we follow. This is who we try to be. This is what we try to do to have that compassion, that love, that care of Christ in our lives so that we can share it with others. And in so doing, we become the body of Christ. We become so bound together, so tied together. We don't know where one stop starts and the other stops, but we each have our place in this time, in this space, and in this community. So today we gather to worship, we gather to share communion, and in that we are reminded of our connection to one another, to all the generations of people who have come before us, to all the generations of people who will come after us. Let us allow this time to fill and strengthen us for the part that we play in the body. Let us help let it allow us and help us to grow in love, in gratitude, and in compassion for all the body's other members. Amen. 
Our next hymn this morning is number 400 at E in Voices United. Let us break a bread together. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So today we share in the sacrament of communion. For the first time in many months, we have a full table. We don't have everybody bringing their own piece of the loaf. And, you know, at first, when we first had to all bring our own elements, I thought, what a horrible way to celebrate communion. And then I realized it's actually a beautiful way to celebrate community because it, it reminds us that we are all part of the body, that we all eat from the same loaf, even though it is in many different forms. But I will admit that I've been looking forward to being able to share it in our traditional way again. And so if you're on our screen, I invite you to get your own elements now. If you are here in the church, uh, we will be serving here, but if you prefer to have your own uh, and have brought them with you, that is perfectly all right as well. I invite you to turn in your bulletin to the Sacrament of Communion. Friends, God sends us out. But first, before that, God gathers us in around this table. One last meal, as it were, to fuel up for the road ahead. All are welcome at this table to enjoy God's hospitality, to eat and to be filled by what God has put in front of us, the gifts of God for the people of God. And so the Lord will be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Great God of all, you sent out your power into the void, creating sky, earth, and sea, plants, animals, and people, commissioning each living thing to praise your name. Yet we fell away from our purpose, following our own path, and sin got its first foothold in the world. When your people were in Egypt, abused, oppressed, exploited, because Pharaoh was afraid of their numbers, you gathered them up and sent them out of Egypt, commissioned them to be your people in a new land, the symbol of your love and justice for all the world to see. Yet these people fell apart, worshiping idols, exploiting the poor, expelling strangers. So you commissioned prophets, women and men, to call them back to your way. And then one day you came to us, a tiny human baby bearing the weight of the greatest commission of all, humanity's redemption, salvation of the world. In your ministry, you gathered in the poor, the hungry, the meek, the outraged, the hypocrites, the outcast, the ill, the curious. And then you sent them out again, remade as your apostles, to share in the work of your ministry, feeding, healing, loving, teaching, praying. You died in Jerusalem while all your disciples were scattered and lost. Three days later, you rose again and called your disciples back to order, reminding them that they still had work to do, reminding them you were always with them, filling them with spirit so that they would never be alone. We praise the spirit who forms us into your people. Pour yourself out, we pray, into these gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may taste to us just like your grace and love. In this meal, give us strength to be your people once more, one more time, united, bold in witness, commissioned, proclaiming your love to all we know until you come again in glory. And until that day, we pray with the words that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On the night before he died, when he knew that he would not be with his disciples much longer, Jesus took them and gave them a sign by which to remember him. He took the bread from the table, and after giving thanks to the Lord for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body. Take and eat, for it is given for you. Each time you do this, remember me. And then in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. So friends, this is the body of Christ, broken, but in it, we are made whole. And this is the cup of blessing, the fruit of the vine, in which we are all connected. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. So let us eat and drink and be filled. All things are now ready. We're going to serve communion in what is called the traditional way which means that it will be served to you in your pews. I'll invite you to hold on to your bread until all have been served and we can eat together and then the same for the juice. Friends, this is the bread of belonging. Eat and be filled. Friends, this is the cup of blessing. Drink, and may it revive your souls.
Will you join with me in the prayer after communion? Jesus, Savior, host, you have filled our bellies with love and our mouths with grace and our hearts with courage for whatever may come. Send us out from this table, energized for hard, messy, faithful, joyous work ahead. The work of being your hands and feet in the world you are still coming to say. Amen. Having been given the gifts of this table, we respond in time, sharing all that we have and all that we are with God. Sometimes that means a monetary offering, sometimes that means our time and our talents. Sometimes, excuse me, sometimes it means our love and our compassion, the effort that we share for the work of God in this world. Whatever it is that you bring to this table today and offer to your God, I invite you to think about it now as we sing our offertory hymn, both verses of number 537, Your Work of God Means Many Things.
having been fed at the table of the Lord. Go knowing that you are the body of Christ and for each and every one of you I give thanks. And as you go, may you go with the blessing and the love of God who is our creator, our redeemer and our sustainer. Jesus, who is our elder brother and the Holy Spirit of life within you this day and evermore.